Hey, welcome to Dan's Model Works, and it's part two of our Lindbergh model of Converse XFY VTO, otherwise known as the Pogo. I guess this is kind of an awkward way to hold the box. And of course, it's hard to get it in the shot this way. But we uh, this is one of the United States Navy's uh, tail sitter prototypes. Two were uh, turbo props, and one had an Avon engine in it. And all three of them did fly. All three of them did transitions. Um, of the two turbo props, only the Pogo took off and landed vertically. So let's get working on this. So if you saw last episode, you'll know that. I was actually pleasantly surprised at how good the fit was. Now there's a little bit of springiness here, but when we give it a slight bit of force, everything comes together pretty good with the fuselage. And I hollowed out the whole cockpit area here because the cockpit opening is actually quite large. And I installed a little bit of styrene here in order to hold our cockpit tub. You can see I've marked front F for front on there. And this just pops in place like this. So before we do any more work on our cockpit, I just want to address the wings, make sure that they're going to go together all right, and make sure that they're going to fit onto the fuselage without any problems. One of the things I've moved ahead on, even though I don't have the fuselage halves glued together, is gluing my wing upper and lower surfaces together. As you can see, we've got them together right here. Um, now you're supposed to trap the, the landing gear between these halves when you put it together. I didn't do that deliberately. I didn't screw up. It's my story. I'm sticking to it. No, I really was thinking, okay, I'll put those in. And then I thought, what are the odds that these things are going to line up perfectly? E.g., the how much they protrude from the wings was going to agree with how much they have to protrude from the tail surfaces. I suppose they're all tail surfaces. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is when, I, when I'm ready to install the landing gear, I'll basically ream things out so that I can, I can, I can put them in, get them lined up so that when it's sitting on its tail, it's not kind of going, boom, 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 boom. So, you know, it may seem like I screwed up, but I didn't. I very deliberately thought about it and thought, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to do that later. So, as I mentioned earlier, now that I don't have to fight to hold the wings together. The wings actually, the fit is really quite good given that the the shape is very complex and the tooling for this was cut, what, in the late 50s, early 60s, something like that? So as I, as I mentioned earlier, that's really quite gratifying. That's good to know. It means that when I do go to put the wings on, it's not going to be a major hassle. And... They did mate up pretty good. There's a little bit of a seam we have to sand right here. We need to clean this up a bit, but otherwise, pretty good. Now, in this shot, you can see I've got some lines drawn on the inside here. And it's the, it's the upper one we're interested in. And that is the top of our, our cockpit tub when it sits inside here. And the reason that that's been drawn on is... If we look at this side, you can see I've put in some ribbing that basically corresponds to the the rivet strips on the outside of the the aircraft here. So I'm going to be duplicating these on the other fuselage half. So I've got way more styrene here than I need to make my seat pan, but I wanted something that I could easily hold on to and 
and get a good bond on before I, I trimmed it down. So we'll see if I can trim this without destroying it. And there is our seat pan all shaped. And remember, you wouldn't ever want to sit on this without your parachute or a seat cushion. This wasn't intended to be where you put your actual arts, but where the parachute went. That's why it's always kind of a little little pan. Now, in addition to the larger outer consoles, there's a smaller ledge on the inside that uh, that also has instruments and switches and doodads and things on it. And so you can see on this side, I've already installed that and started putting various bits and baubles on it. The other side, all I've done is put one one gauge on there. Um, I have started making the, the lower inner ledge, but it's not ready to go on yet. It's way more days than I'd like to admit, but I've got both the side consoles basically finished. Now, gauges don't give me any problem, and little raised panel sections don't give me a problem. What I find hard to make is things like switch gear, you know, where it's a toggle switch. If it's a knob, no problem at all. Let's see if I turn it sideways, you can see two of the massive things that I'm hoping to call switch gear, but they, they really look bigger than they should. But um, this is pretty much all I'm going to be doing to the side walls. These three pieces of plastic are going to be our instrument panel and it's in three pieces it's actually quite a large construction here there's a central area that's um, that's taller then there's a smaller area off to the left and a larger area to the right and these two side bits are a bit of an angle so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be drilling holes wherever I want the gauges to be and then I'm going to be backing these pieces of plastic up with another piece of plastic that will blank off the back side of those gauges. They still need a little bit of cleanup, but here's our three basic instrument panel faces. Um, they're not perfect, but I think they do give the effect. And they're better than nothing at all, which is what we currently have. We still need to put our... Um, our straps, our seat belts in, but mostly the seat is done. There does need to be kind of a little tongue coming out of the bottom here, and that will actually have the control stick on it. It seems to be mounted on the bottom of the seat, which kind of makes sense because, you know, when it pivots, you still want to have the, the control column in the same basic spot relative to you. Step two to making instrument panels is you take your very thin pieces of styrene, which I should have mentioned are usually 10 thou thick, and you mount them on a thicker piece of plastic, a backer piece, and that's going to give you where you're basically the front of your gauges because you're going to put a drop of gloss back paint in there. Um, so for some reason or other, my camera doesn't want to focus on this very clearly. Let's move away, but there we go. So you can see here's a central panel, there's the one on the left, and there's the one on the right. There we go, we've got our three gauge clusters glued together, and as you can see the outer bits are angled, and I've already checked to make sure that this is in fact going to fit within our cockpit opening. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have the, the main part seems to have a, um, a heavier back on it. And I'm going to make that slightly angled and make that my mounting point. The wing pieces seem to be without backs. And if we look at the picture, you can see that there's the, the, the instrument cases, the backs of the gauges are basically round and they're open. So I'm going to try to replicate that. And I think this is all I'm going to add to our control panel. There's a couple of switches high up on it a few small boxes and things and added one more gauge to the upper left hand corner there because I didn't notice it initially in the picture but it seems to have been a late add when they built the real panel okay it's been a really tough week I haven't gotten a whole lot done although I see my last 
Um, my last image that I took was before I painted the instrument panel. Here you can see it's been glued in place. The fuselage halves are just temporarily held together just to see how it fits. It does seem to sit in there pretty good. I still have to paint the the front side or the back side. I'm probably just going to do that semi-gloss black. You can see I've added an air tank right there that shows in one of the um, one of the period pieces that I have uh, on found online. The This is our tub. You can see the sides have all been painted. Now this round thing here in the middle, that's just basically where I'm going to perch the seat. And the seat itself still needs a couple little details painted on it. It certainly looks more like what we see in the pictures, especially the back side when we have it flipped forward. The control column seems to be come off of a, a, a tongue that comes from underneath the, the bottom part of the seat. The actual rudder pedals seem to be suspended underneath the control panel, which seems odd because if when the whole seat rotates forward, that means the guy's got to have his legs like kind of up in the air. But they're definitely not mounted to the seat because you can see they're not in the picture. And um, some of the literature from the time seems to indicate that they're suspended underneath the instrument panel and you can't see them. Okay, we're taking a step into the point of no return now. I've glued the bucket in place. I know it should fit. I've been able to test fit the instrument panel. I know by measuring that this should fit. Um, it really only has a gluing point here and one point here and then it runs across the bottom of this angle styrene that I've glued in. And I pretty much have to wait till the glue sets up till I can bring the other fuselage in and make sure it's all a okay. But you can see, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that, that round piece in there, that's basically what the seat is going to perch on. Now I haven't decided if I'm going to have it flipped forward or if I'm going to have it in a more natural position. I almost forgot to put some uh, seat belts in here. So as you can see, I've just basically used uh, some strips of masking tape. I'm going to paint them green, mostly so that they'll stand out better against the, uh, the silver of the seat. So as you can see, I've got our fuselage clothes pin together here just to hold it together so we can see how things are, are going with our cockpit. Um, the seat has been glued in and I think it looks pretty happy in there. I still have to paint that oxygen tank and I think what I'm going to do is all of these exposed surfaces here I'm going to paint those semi-gloss black because they would want to cut down on the amount of glare that it would be on the inside of the uh, canopy, in my humble opinion, and usually all those areas tend to be blacked out inside a fighter jet anyway. I know this never actually made it to, you know, frontline surface, but I can't see them wanting those areas to be shiny. But I'm reasonably happy with the way the uh, cockpit has gotten populated. Now, I did put it in a normal flying position. I did debate having it cocked forward at 45 degrees because, of course, it's going to be displayed like this, but I just thought that would end up blocking a lot of the detail that I'd put in there and would require an explanation every time somebody looked at it. So I checked it out and I put it in a normal position. Now, before I uh, seal up the fuselage halves, which is not imminent, oddly enough, we need to address the fact that there's nothing going on right here. Okay. Um, this obviously is where the exhaust from our two turboprops is going to be coming from. Because if we pop the wing back on, there we go. You can see there's the inlet. 
I say two turbo props because um, the engine that was in this was in fact two smaller turbo props that were joined together as a single power unit. So there was actually two separate exhausts, two separate inlets and everything like that. So you can see here's the inlet, there's one on the other side. So you'd want to have two exhausts and as you can see by the shape of our tail, there should be basically two pipes coming out of there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to build a plate that will blank this area off and then I'm going to install some tubing in there to create our exhaust. Now it won't extend past our opening here because you can see in the pictures there's nothing sticking out so we don't want that to happen. Using a little bit of trial and error I've got one half of my bulkhead here pretty close to what I want. So I've compared this to the other side of the fuselage and it seems to fit pretty good too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically chop this guy into, flip it over and trace that profile over here. So that way I'll have two halves that I can slide into the sides of the fuselage. Well, I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> I don't think I could have gotten that any better. So what I'll do is I'll put a strip of styrene attached to the back of one of these so when we close it up we don't get any light leaks. But we're just about ready to put some um, exhaust pipes in there. And here is one of the exhaust pipes glued in place. Now Visually, this is just about the right size. Um, it basically fills up about half the cavity, which is what you would expect. Why would you have a much larger opening than you need? But it was also confirmed via the um, dimensions given on Wikipedia for each of the two turboprop engines. Because remember, the engine that was in this was actually basically two turboprops married together and each outside diameter of the power section was about how oh, 500 mil millimeters something like that if you scale that down that comes to just about a centimeter and that's what this plastic tubing was so i'll bring together the other side and you can see what it looks like there we go there's our exhaust section featuring at least some basic detail I mean, I don't know if this is 100% accurate as to what there should be, but uh, in terms of there should be two basic exhaust pipes, um, I think it's better than what there was, which was nothing. Um, I will be painting the very center black. The pipes themselves are going to be jet exhaust, and everything else is going to be silver. And remember, these are not actually for creating thrust these are just basically exhaust for the turboprops i'm sure there was a small amount of thrust but not much and that's our exhaust all painted up like i said earlier a uh, a turboprop is basically a jet turbine eg a jet although the uh the exhaust portion is not what's intended to actually be causing the, the motive power, the exhaust, does look similar. So I'm trying to come up with a reason why I shouldn't be gluing this together. I was slightly concerned that the propeller boss had to be trapped, but it doesn't. It goes on from the front. So I think we could probably glue this together. All right, so we've got our fuselage halves and our tail halves, obviously, because they're included, glued together. Uh, the fit was good enough that I don't need any tape or anything to hold it together. Mostly just on the tail. Um, I've got the clothespins on there. All I did was just uh, hold it together and use a very fast setting cement to hold it together. And we'll just take a peek at the, at the painted exhaust there. Which I think looks a lot better and more plausible than nothing. Which was what we had. 
I would like to apologize to anyone who's found it difficult to follow my projects in the last year. By the time this video goes up, it will have been five or six weeks since the last video went up, and probably two months since I did a video on the Pogo. When I started the channel, I was aiming for a video every week to week and a half, and for a long time, I kept to that. However, for the last year or more, the time between videos has stretched longer and longer. It has not been for a lack of desire to build models, but a serious lack of energy altogether. I've been blaming working seven nights a week for a lack of energy. However, that's been going on for the last 10 years. Honestly, it's been all I could do to just barely function, eat, sleep, interact a bit with the kids, and go back to work. Before my father passed away in 2017, I would regularly spend a few hours on hobbies or chores. I often would ride my bike for an hour and a half a day in the summertime. As some of you saw in the post I put up at the end of November, I went in for a sleep study. I got the results a couple of weeks ago. It turns out I have sleep apnea. According to the specialist, it's one of the most severe cases she's seen. The average person while sleeping stops breathing about four times an hour. It's no big deal. Your brain notices and you start you back up again. In my case, at best, I stopped 41 times per hour. And during REM sleep, I was sleeping or I was stopping breathing 93 times per hour. And every time you stop breathing, you'd wake up. I wasn't just not getting enough sleep. The sleep I was getting was just about worthless. The doctor said, I've probably been sleep deprived for the last year. It's like a toddler poking you in the forehead every 45 seconds when you sleep, and I had no idea it was happening. So the sleep specialist prescribed a CPAP machine for me to use when I'm sleeping. And from here on in, when I sleep, I need to use one of those funky sleep masks. So I got the machine about a week and a half ago, and I've been using it faithfully, and I think it's making a difference. Uh, my sleep feels different. I seem to be doing a little bit better in terms of energy and being able to, to function and do stuff. Uh, although, like I've said to many people, I don't even really know what feeling good feels like anymore or what feeling rested feels like anymore. It's been so long. We'll just have to see. But thanks for following along on the journey. And, and until next time, just keep on modeling.